It was February of 1966, and the second invasion of the US was in full effect. High above planet Earth, the combined rebel fleets that arrived from many different galaxies and planets were in heavy conflict with the Imperial fleets. Infantry on the ground was reinforced and aided via armor and air support. From the south, more armies of Earth headed across Central America to link up with the upcoming clash to take back North America, the final front of this war. Battles had spread out and were now being fought in the countrysides of America, where the visibility was excellent for Imperial armor, but also giving opportunity for earthen artillery or swift bombing runs. America was set ablaze. But even in the cities that were taken, the threat of Palpatine could still be felt as TIE fighters harassed different districts to remind their enemy troops that their armies were still at the city's borders. The scale of the war was insane, as it included many different countries over a front line that was so vast that it even expanded into various time zones. Communications from the outer west point to the east were sometimes a bit scrambled, but the logistics system supported by intel from the air kept everything in line. The invasion headed now into its fifth month, and the two armies on the two continents were still not connected. Imperial walkers in fortified positions hindered the army approaching from the south, and help was requested to the rebel allies from space to perform precision strikes to clear a path. From the sky, one could see the impact that the rebel aid had made on Palpatine's defense. The Comintern forces sunk their teeth into the Americas and refused to let go. Every day, more and more walkers, on two, three, four, or more legs, made their approach, but could not break the spirits and barriers set up by the earthen and rebel armies. With each passing week, more and more reinforcements from the continents to the east arrived, spirits and morale high to support their troops for the cause of liberating Earth. It was a fight for a regime, and even those who did not support the communist cause realized that for now, the fight was not for communism, but for the survival of Earth itself. Once the dust had settled, and one would look at the world map once more, the fate of communism and the common term as a whole would be decided. The battle for Washington, a city now almost unrecognizable after having endured so much conflict in the past decennia, still raged on, shifting between advances from both sides. Khrushchev also authorized the use of nuclear weapons on American soil. It showcased that he truly did not care about the America's future. He promised the Soviet Union would support the communist government in America with funds, but many knew these were false promises. In America, North and South were now united, leaving a few encircled imperial units who either perished or turned sides. In the Midwest, the front had shifted harshly towards the North, even entering the outskirts of former Canada. Germany played a huge part in reinforcing the whole line wherever help was necessary. Despite the front line reaching the border of Canada, a few of Palpatine's elite managed to hold the position as they buried themselves deep behind enemy lines. But though their methods were effective, they were too few to turn the tide of war. More nukes were dropped on American soil that was poisoned slowly with each drop. And even Canada was not spared, as Khrushchev wanted to finish off this conflict quickly. The bombs were always dropped way behind enemy lines to avoid friendly casualties. Washington was still considered a danger zone, but slowly the armies here were finally able to head northeast. This was the only side where progress was very slow. The second invasion within America was now going on for more than half a year. The spread of the earthen armies were incredible, clearly seen from aerial footage. The aerial footage also reconfirmed the dominance of Soviet and German armies throughout the American lands. Fled citizens and army soldiers originating from America were being sorted to head back into society in their former homes south and east, away from the battlefield lines. The war was going so well by now that new invasions at other parts were successfully pulled off. By now it was clear that several high-ranking officers in Palpatine's army had called for evacuations as more ships were destroyed high above the earth. To some, they already admitted defeat. In the east, a new invasion was set in motion as well by multiple nations. They were able to hold the coast relatively easily, but would have quite a task ahead of them to link up with the main armies to the west. Palpatine's most hardened units were still stationed here and would not, unlike others, wimp out and flee. 
Though the armies in the west that arrived with the recent invasion were making great progress towards the north, part of the stormtroopers had broken through and were moving down south, claiming some victories in the name of their emperor. The battlefields containing Palpatine's most battle-hardened units had been dubbed the Marshes of the Dead, as stories were told among soldiers at other places that the bodies piled so high that they reached above the waters left by all the crater impacts. The freshly arrived troops west and east were too few to really create a powerful pincer attack, but movement could be felt nonetheless. The troops to the east had a rough few first weeks, as they too would face the most elite units that Palpatine had to offer. But they had the advantage that they attacked their flank and had the element of surprise the first handful of days. The Imperial Galactic units alongside the west had managed to widen the gap between the two main forces, cutting like a knife through butter. But the front to their left increased as more parts of Canada were taken. The east spread out as well. They had more success north as there wasn't that much resistance, but the gains were not as rich or spoilful. By now, Germany had unleashed an invasion as well, hoping to cut off another head of the Hydra-like force that was presented by Palpatine's units to the east. The soldiers fighting at the west also had to bear hardships, but it was nothing compared to the ones in the east. But though blood was spilled, it was clear to many that this would now lead to a victory for the humans of Earth. Even the gap that was opened like a wound by the stormtroopers to the west was slowly being closed, the Comintern forces pushing the pace like a bulldozer. It would take several months for them to close it up and realign with the rest of the front, but their claimed victories fueled morale and spirit. Battles now had shifted mainly towards thick forestry and mountainous terrain, leaving Palpatine's armies mostly without their bigger armor support. They mostly sent in infantry, and the infantry could not hide from the cruel scorching that nuclear bombs did unto them. For days on end, multiple bombs were dropped, eviscerating anything in sight and leaving nothing but death and decay to be inherited by the human race. The war for America did indeed rage on and it became almost two full years of combat. The backlash that the galactic invader had felt could be seen from far above as its power and influence had shrunken to tiny proportions. And the bombing never stopped. From all sides, the soldiers of Earth made the Imperial troopers feel what it was like to have everything they owned be taken away from them. Cruelty was handed out left and right. The amount of troops that Palpatine now had left in Canada was laughable. Yet still the orders were given to use nuclear weapons to rid themselves of the invader like cockroaches. It was going so well, in fact, that the first treaties were signed to start rebuilding American cities and villages and get society back to how it was supposed to be in the eyes of a communist ruler. As the year of 1968 went by, the remaining units from Palpatine did all but fend for nothing. More evacuations were greenlit, and on some other fronts, the only opposing threat were mere battle droids, easy to destroy or disengage by taking out the control ships. It was by then clear that the humans had won this war that had raged on for almost 30 years. Palpatine's ship was seen jumping to another system, accompanied by multiple guarding fleets. This meant that he would be back someday, but as time would progress, the weaponry and tech of the human race would develop as well, and all would be ready to make a stance once more. By the end of September 1968, no more stormtroopers nor clones were accounted for. Most of the soldiers were called back, and the last remaining ones would sweep the area to claim it back in the name of humanity. Many found it hard to believe that the war was over. But how does one move on from a conflict that had scarred the earth and multiple generations for 30 ongoing years? Though the war had been won, the earthly outlook had changed drastically. Communism ruled the entire planet. The United States were dubbed the Communist States, just as many other countries and nations had to adhere to these changes. The Comintern ruled all. But its government was more naive than one might think. Though many men and women fought against the Galactic Invader, 
They did in fact not, unlike what the government wanted to believe, fight for communism or the Comintern. They fought for their own freedom. For the freedom of their families and friends, and for the freedom of planet Earth. Now that the dust had settled, for some, the battle was not yet over. As cities and towns were rebuilt, there were others that gathered men and would, over the time to come, try to find support for those to see that one tyrant had only been exchanged for another. There was a certain irony in the fact that to destroy the monster, one had to become the monster itself. Many would debate if the same result would have been granted where the earthen leadership not be so strict and absolute. Almost three years after the war had ended, much of the battle scars could still be seen and felt. Europe by then had not seen conflict for more than 10 years, and most that was left were the bunkers and fortifications, ironically mostly used to battle the Soviets. But in those three years, support for the return of democracy did indeed rise. Part of the rebel fleet that had aided in the decisive second invasion of America had left, but there were some rebels who realized that the earth in the state would be no different than another terrorizing empire on a smaller scale. Under the cover of diplomatic interests, many stayed in different countries as they kept a sharp eye on the progress of anti-communist support. And then on the 14th of November, 1973, with help from the rebels that still remained there, a revolt occurred in Britain against the communist government. But it was not a sole incident comparable to the revolt in India. Germany and France joined as well, fueled by the resisting voices heard all the way from Britain. A revolution on this scale would be very effective, were it not that the Comintern held most of the world as a whole. Even with rebel help, it would still be difficult to take down the tyrannical government. But even the Russians themselves could no longer stand with the crude and cold stance taken by their own leaders. Millions joined and opted for freedom and to honor the values so harshly learned by having our home invaded as a human race. The fact that the Russians defied their own government of course resulted in more nations standing tall, including America and Turkey. All were aided by the rebels, who would not leave until the common term would be crippled. The sweeping power of the revolution even spurred all the way over to Asia, where it latched onto those brave enough to resist. And thus the world was at its own throat again, waging war with one another, like nothing had changed. Governments were overthrown, tyrants were decapitated, and history was rewritten by the victor. Everyone fighting for their own views of what the shape of the world should be like. And thus bombs fell once more onto Europe, scorching earth, flesh, and poisoning the air. The battle would never stop. The conflict would never stop. And those thriving for power, whether it be on our globe or out there in the vast galaxy, would never stop. War had been the sole truth of our planet, and we were too fond to give up on it. Hey everybody, and thank you for experiencing this unique series with me to the end. Before I talk about this series as a whole, let me just throw out there that I recently started a review channel where I review games. The channel will be more of a leisure channel and so there won't be a review there every week, but maybe three to four reviews per month, both old and new games. You can find the Kanoa Reviews channel in the description down below, so please check it out and if you like what you see, please subscribe and maybe even leave a comment of a game that you would like me to review on that channel. Now to get back on this Hearts of Iron 4 series, I decided to start this series as I have done multiple attempts to make a Star Wars vs. Earth series via Man of War, but also Arma. During those series, many people asked for something like a world map to get a better understanding of the progress of the war. Because of that, I decided to use the War of the Worlds mod and change some things slightly to make it look like the Empire was invading Earth. Now, of course, even then, you had still people complaining about the authenticity of it, uh, saying things like they would blow up the Earth in seconds with the Death Star or orbital bombardments with Star Destroyers. And yes, this is all true. But that would also make for a very short or a very boring series, showcasing why some people should not be tasked with writing a series as that would not be a very good one. Though originally I wanted to do the series during the modern age, the War of the Worlds mods and the Millennium Dawn mod unfortunately clashed, and I could not get them to work at the same time. I was very happy though with the earlier episodes providing cool looking battles via the Man of War Galaxy at War mod. 
Some people asked why, as the series progressed, uh, those sections were cut out, and the answer is very simple. Man of War is only uh, World War II, and by that time we had ventured into the Vietnam territory. I know that there are some Vietnam mods out there, but I believe also they will clash with the Galaxy at War uh, mod, if I'm not mistaken. Those weapons and tanks were simply not in the game, and so I had to resort to Arma a bit, but Arma battles are of course also a little bit less spectacular to film. Overall, I am very happy though with this series, as it is one of the most more original ones, and it is finally a Star Wars vs. Earth series that I finally finished to completion. It wasn't perfect though, as the Martian Invasion Force AI had a lot to be desired. Uh, this is not the fault of the mod creator, who I think did a fantastic job. The fault lies with the regular Hearts of Iron A4 uh, AI. This series was the one series where I ma uh, manipulated it the most. Multiple times I had to play short segments as the aliens themselves, as they simply would refuse to invade any other continent than America. And the invasion in Africa was entirely orchestrated by me, and even then they barely sent in any reinforcements, which resulted in them being pushed back by the rest of the common turn. I also realized that the other nations waging war with one another would be a scenario that would not be very plausible. Maybe if I had this done in a historically inaccurate uh, setting, this would be the case. The invasion of the Americas was also orchestrated as not one nation could do anything about it. I let the game run until 1975, and not once did any of the common terms successfully invade America. It even kept crashing at a certain point. Nevertheless though, I think it is very cool with how it worked out in the end. Though I do realize that some of you might have wanted to see the revolution against communism, it was ne uh, necessarily not necessarily what this series was about. The main story and... Uh, the war would be Palpatine invading Earth, and many of you said that you would prefer to join the Imperials over a communist government. So in a way, the story might not have a happy ending. But I think though that this is very important, because that means that when you watch a series on my channel, that you always have to keep in mind that it can also end badly. That means that the stakes are quite high, and a happy ending is never a guarantee. That will probably make it more exciting. As this series is now coming to a close, of course I will also once again upload the series as a whole entire episode. I might wait a couple of days though with this, uh, as other series are also almost at their final episode, and if I, can, if I can upload some of those longer videos in the same week, it gives me time to already work on multiple episodes of the next series and upload them shortly after one another, instead of, you know, having a week in between. Let me know in the comments uh, down below what, what the next Hearts of Iron series is that you want to see. Many of you have asked for Red World, uh, but there are also many other options available as well. Thank you guys so much for watching and all of the great support. I will see you all next time in the next cinematic series.